Hi, guys. Uh, so uh, anybody here that was at uh, my partner Mike Stonebreaker's talk yesterday? Yeah. Did he abuse the color palette <laughs> effectively? Uh, Mike's a uh, uh, great guy and one of my good partners, and most of what I'm going to say here is inspired by Mike and, uh, and our colleagues in some way, shape, or form. But um, So I'm going to talk about uh, three things. First, uh, this idea that one size does not fit all in database systems um, and uh, the proliferation of all the different new database engines and how to represent uh, uh, bits on disk uh, to optimize database performance. Uh, secondly, we'll talk about some sizes of these uh, new systems that are available and uh, uh, some especially that are interesting and useful for uh, the support of scientific applications. And then third, uh, I'll go through some of the experiences that we've had in the, uh, for lack of a better term, database fitting room uh, in the applications that we've done at, at Novartis um, and uh, where we're closely with uh, one of Doug's uh, friends and mine, a guy named Ramey Avard. Um, so, uh, first and foremost, uh, the, this, the, you know, the challenge is sort of the classic, you know, big data stuff that we all uh, know and love and we all experience all the time. But uh, we're seeing this really uh, acutely in the life sciences. Uh, there's a, a new technology uh, for, for uh, genetic sequencing that's generally called NGS or next generation sequencing uh, that's uh, evolved into the marketplace over the last three or four years, uh, and it has radically increased the amount of uh, capacity required to support uh, basic uh, life science research. And so this curve w looks even worse for us in the life sciences and specifically for anyone doing uh, drug discovery. Uh, the other challenge that we have uh, in, 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 a, in a big way in the, in the life sciences is uh, the cost of data quality. Uh, and we've got a lot of scientists that are used to working in an academic lab and they kind of get trained, all right, I'm going to produce some data, I'm going to throw it into uh, some Postgres database and I'll figure out kind of later what I'm going to, how I'm going to analyze it and, and what I'm going to do with it. And what happens is they very quickly lose touch with the quality of that data and oftentimes have to go back and rework their experiments. This is okay when you're in an academic setting, it's fine to rework experiments. When you're in a commercial setting, we have uh, experiments that, that sometimes cost us tens of millions of dollars. And so uh, reworking an experiment because you didn't capture the correct metadata uh, is uh, you know, a very expensive uh, proposition in our world. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later. Okay, so, so it was about six or so years ago that my, my partner Mike and a whole bunch of our buddies uh, published a paper uh, at VLDB and kind of claiming that uh, it was time for uh, the uh, database uh, business to have, uh, for lack of a better term, kind of an enema. Um, and the technologies that, that we had been, you know, adopted very broadly in terms of online transaction processing engines had become prolific and the vendors had sort of uh, become used to uh, just providing the same one design pattern for every single workload that was out there. And uh, the, the challenge with that was that this, uh, you know, where the database industry had started as being when, when OLTP was first implemented as kind of a small uh, group. Now this was like 15 to 20 billion dollars a year in, in revenue and, and uh, money that was flowing into these vendors and they weren't using any of that money really to, to do significant innovation. They were just kind of milking it. And oh, oh, so over, over the course of you know 25 or 30 years what uh, uh, Mike and, and uh, his academic partners realized was that the, uh, these 25-year-old uh, OLTP designed engines that were designed for most, right, mostly kind of applications really ignored the evolution of, uh, of processing and, and memory that was available. And relative to the available processing power and, and, and memory that um, disk bandwidth had, had really not changed uh, as dramatically. And so what you had was this experience that we've all probably had in some way, shape, or form that uh, we felt uh, uh, disk uh, I.O. bandwidth constraint. Uh, getting stuff on and off of disk was always a huge problem and it always came back to this, this, this disk I.O. bottleneck. And 
it really, uh, you know, when you look at how these engines were originally designed, uh, whether it's Oracle or, or uh, uh, SQL Server, or they're all kind of cut from the same basic design cloth, uh, they, they really weren't optimized to, to, to run in these environments. And it, I don't know if is there anybody that manages Oracle Rack here, anybody that's worked with Oracle Rack. Like, I, you know, I, I tried to put up at one point a, a, a 25 or 30 terabyte uh, Oracle Rack cluster, and I, I had been away from Oracle for many years uh, and uh, fell victim to the kind of the marketing stuff. And uh, I just found out it just didn't work, right? I mean, this was a, this was a system that was not designed to be a uh, uh, shared memory, shared disk system. This was, you know, a, uh, a, a 30 or 40 year old uh, design in terms of uh, uh, its fundamental architecture. And so, uh, you know, I started looking for, for new things, and uh, as did Mike. And what we, we really saw was that, you know, sort of through the 1990s and into, uh, into the, the, the early 2000s, that we, we sort of outstripped the ability of these traditional engines to do what customers needed, and most of the big vendors had uh, started to add a uh, very strange feature and function that allowed customers to kind of do what they needed, materialized views or bitmap indexes in, in, in Oracle are a good example, kind of the evolution of this whole OLAP thing where you're going to take all the data and cache it in these materialized views. But they were like Frankensteins. They became these these engines, these systems became Frankensteins. They were trying to get an engine to do what it was never really designed to do in terms of representing data in read format. And so, uh, as you get into the 2000s, you start to th see things like Google Big Table and Hadoop and, and ultimately Vertica and a whole bunch of other systems that evolve uh, to uh, address this you know specific workload that is a read oriented workload. So that rather than uh, you know, representing bits on disk in a form that it's uh, coming into the into the system. Uh, you really want to represent the bits on disk in a form in which the queries are going to be run against that system. And uh, Mike and I started Vertica to to do just that. And after about five years after the C store paper, you know, the kind of the rest of the world started to to recognize us a bit. And we were relatively successful. We had a bunch of applications and and uh, customers of Vertica that. Uh, were up and running and it experienced 100x uh, kinds of improvements in performance and radical improvements in, in terms of cost, um, sort of getting away from the uh, shared disk kinds of configurations that the Oracles and the EMCs would, would have you uh, like. So this is, this is a bunch of sort of history, right, um, and probably familiar history to, to many of you here. So then during the course of the 2000s, what happens is you get all of these new uh, companies that start to emerge, and the venture capitalists get really busy in funding. They see companies like Natiza go out and selling proprietary uh, hardware uh, that does uh, optimization of uh, read-oriented uh, data warehouse workloads. And uh, they, they seem to be very successful, you know, worth more than a billion dollars. And so there's lots of funding that starts to flow into database systems people that want to build new and interesting engines uh, that are optimized for specific workloads. But as in normal uh, course and, and fashion, oftentimes these engines uh, and these companies get built around whatever uh, uh, dynamics are going on in the, in the financial industry, very rarely are they designed around a specific workload that's useful to, to actual end users. And so we're sort of muddling through right now this proliferation of all these different new database engines that are available to people and how they use them. Uh, and, you know, there are probably a lot of Hadoop folks here. Anybody, you know, familiar with Hadoop and use Hadoop? Right? Yeah, lots. So... Like when Hadoop first came out, I remember people saying, oh, you know, Hadoop's going to kill Oracle and, like, all these crazy things. <laughs> and, you know, like, it, it, Hadoop is great. MapReduce is great for what it's designed for and what it's good for. Um, but uh, the, the, the community in general, and especially the non-technical community, have a very difficult time understanding exactly where these new technologies and these new engines fit um, into the, the sort of portfolio of workloads that... Uh, that we all manage on a day-to-day -day basis. And so there's a, a number of companies, and I'm going to talk about a few of these, these new engines that are, that are coming out, but I think that the, 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 the primary message I want to uh, communicate to you guys today is that I, I really believe that there's a need to, uh, for sort of a framework 
to try and match different engines that are available to different workloads for, uh, for, for database systems. And that we, you know, you've got all this, true. you didn't, there was no choice for, for 20 or 30 years. Now there's this proliferation and lots of choice. And what we have to uh, do is get a little bit better at kind of picking which engines are right for which workloads. Um, uh, and, and also with the caveat that a lot of these engines are new and unproven and uh, developing. So to this point, if it's been proven that one size does not fit all and there are all these new engines out there, how do you pick the right, the, the right thing? And uh, what, what we're lacking, one of the things that we're lacking for this new framework uh, to, to decide which engines are right for which workloads is uh, empirical characteristics of the workloads themselves and the actual engines. And so uh, the traditional empirical benchmark for database systems was uh, uh, database, uh, a benchmark called TPC, which was developed by a whole bunch of folks, including my friend Dave DeWitt um, at University of Wisconsin way back in the day. But TPC was really about transaction processing. It really wasn't about what people are doing today with database systems. Um, and so there sort of needs to be this complete rethink and a re-implementation of uh, benchmarks that are based on empirical characteristics of workloads and that allow us the value of that, that those benchmarks is then to be able to uh, test these new engines against those workloads and uh, figure out which, uh, which engines uh, fit uh, for which ones. And so there's also kind of this new behavior. Um, if you're, you know, the average uh, database professional today, uh, you, somebody comes to you with a new application or a new system, you're like, all right, you know, you sort of crack open your favorite engine of choice, MySQL, Postgres, Oracle, you name it, and you just start, you know, creating a schema, you start putting data in, you start playing around with it and doing things. And um, oftentimes that turns into a, you know, a test system and then it turns into a production system, and before you know it, you've got a schema and an engine uh, that are mismatched uh, to the workload at scale uh, that um, uh, that, that you have to tackle, and then you have a migration problem migrating from you know whatever engine you happen to pick or whatever was your favorite to some new engine and the folks at, at a lot of the internet companies have been going through this uh, 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 over and over again over the past ten years. Um, you know, sort of see this path where people kind of start with MySQL and then they move to Memcache uh, and then they start to do sharding and like, but the whole thing is basically a reflection of the fact that uh, they didn't really think about the ultimate workload they were going to end up with when they started with MySQL. And so, um, uh, not to disparage MySQL in any way, shape, or form, but just it's not the right answer for everything on the face of the planet. And we've got to consider in advance, based on empirical workloads um, and benchmarks, which engine is right for, for which thing. So, so that's kind of the first part. All right, so now I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about science systems. How are we doing for time? What's the... We're doing good? Okay. All right. So um, so one of the ways you can bend, so in the, in the absence of empirical benchmarks uh, uh, that show you which engines work for which workloads, one of the simplistic ways to start to bucket uh, what the characteristics of these engines are are based on the uh, fundamental underlying technology and how they represent bits on disk. And so we, you know, I like to think of the traditional uh, database engines, whether it's Oracle, MySQL, Postgres, SQL Server, as these, ro they're, they're essentially row-oriented systems, right? They represent bits on disk in the form in which data comes into those systems, one uh, field at a time, right, uh, uh, or af after the other. The column-oriented databases like HBase or the one that Mike and I uh, worked on together, Vertica, um, uh, re the next bits on disk are uh, the next uh, uh, record uh, in a specific column of data so that you don't have to uh, read columns of data that aren't necessary in order to answer any given query. And uh, these are great for, and I think pro have been proven great for, for read-oriented workloads and especially powerful when combined with a highly distributed uh, system architecture. Uh, the third uh, category for me are these uh, sort of file-oriented uh, or MapReduce-like uh, kinds of engines, Hadoop being the, the, the most uh, obvious. And um, 
really allow you to do lots of searches in a massively parallelized way. And kind of traditional database folks would, you know, kind of think of MapReduce as kind of a great uh, ETL tool. Um, I think that's a kind of a mischaracterization, but uh, but that's kind of how they, they a lot of them think about it. Um, so that's. Uh, then you've also got these document-oriented databases. So you've got uh, these database systems like Couch and Mongo uh, that uh, uh, allow you to extract structured data out of uh, unstructured content and sort of believe that the, fi the, the fundamental way that bits should be represented on disk is in uh, the form of documents, uh, not rows or, or columns. And those are useful for very many things. And then one that I, you know, I'm particularly excited about that, that uh, Mike uh, really has been driving is a, um, uh, an array native database uh, that's now called uh, Paradigm 4, it was called SciDB. And uh, I really believe that when you look under the covers that um, uh, of kind of what how people are going to represent aggregated data uh, in the next five or ten years, that the, the way that that data looks, it almost all looks like an array in some way, shape, or form. And that the, the relational nature of much of the data that exists in databases today is just a reflection of uh, the, the success and the popularity of the relational uh, uh, data model. And that when you really try and look at the questions that, that, that users are trying to ask and the analytics that they're trying to run, oftentimes it requires this array native uh, database uh, representation. And I think Mike's on the cutting edge of this. It start, the, the inspiration for that project actually started uh, in uh, astronomy um, with folks out at, uh, in Stanford um, that are building this uh, a huge telescope, and um, they, they think about their data uh, naturally, as, as do a lot of people in geospatial uh, as, uh, as natively in, in arrays. So that's another sort of form of, of uh, database. And then you've got these graph databases. A lot of people doing social network analysis are using these kinds of graph databases. Uh, Neo4j is one, and, and uh, there are a bunch of others, um, and they're all relatively uh, new and uh, 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 fairly uh, immature in terms of their development as commercial third-party commercial systems. And then you also have this category of thing uh, that I, I kind of lump into the same bucket, which are um, things like com uh, composite software or TEED, which is the old MetaMatrix product that, that Red Hat bought. And they're kind of like, you know, like the, the, the if, if you're not going to integrate uh, data, then you have to federate it in some way, shape, or form. But wouldn't it be great to be able to do some federation with an eye towards performance? Um, and uh, the challenge with data federation has always been that uh, if you start to loosely couple these data sources, you, you really have a hard time in, in understanding the performance characteristics of the underlying data sources and representing that up through the federation layer. And um, I think we're to the point now where, you know, you can probably actually do some pretty good cost estimation of the, the, the queries for these federated systems, and uh, companies like Composite are doing a very good job. Um, so, uh, so, so that's kind of, for me, that's kind of the current lands landscape. So in the absence of these empirical benchmarks that would let you say, okay, here are the 10 workloads that we want, here are the engines that match to those workloads, uh, the, the simplistic way to start bucketing all these engines and say, oh, you've got row stores, column stores, kind of based on the technology or how they represent bits on disk, which I think probably correlates to the the empirical workloads that they support. Um, but, uh, you know, we'd much rather that it be, you know, more... Uh, more quantitative. Uh, so there's another there's another dynamic that's going on that, that that's really important when it comes to picking these new engines and using these engines, which is this integrated uh, skill set. Um, we had this problem at Vertica over and over again, where we would go in and and a lot of our customers would say. Um, all right, well, what, what do you need to, to get this new system up and running? And we're like, well, we need, you know, 500 nodes, and those things, you know, look like commodity, you know, off-the-shelf systems for two or three grand a pop, and they all have DAS, and they all... And, you know, many of the, the folks we were talking to were these database folks that were traditionally used to using shared storage, and they were traditionally used to, you know, having these very large systems on which they ran Oracle or, or, or whatever. And 
Uh, the, the idea that you had to build and maintain a large cluster and that you had to ma manage the data that's on that cluster in an integrated way and think about it as sort of a database design problem, and it, uh, that was, uh, for many of those customers, that was a foreign concept. Now, there's probably a lot of people in this room that, you know, wouldn't think twice about uh, doing, doing that kind of thing. But, um, but many of the folks in sort of the average uh, uh, companies uh, really had a hard time thinking about it. And they had sort of become so functional in their administration and design tasks that they, uh, it was difficult to think about their data and cluster administration as, as, as kind of one thing, which I think is, is a very healthy way to think about the way that uh, skill sets need to evolve uh, in the database industry over the next five or ten years. That, we really need people that can think about uh, all the system resources that are available to them, both persistence as well as processor and memory, and how to bring all of those resources to bear uh, to solve the hard analytic problems that uh, end users have. So I'll drill, di drill down now a little bit and talk about what we've been doing at the Novartis Institute for Biomedical Research. Um, and it starts with our, our, our data engineering team. Uh, which is a, a little bit different. We've got folks on this team that not only are database systems uh, experts and, and professionals, uh, but also uh, are uh, hardcore uh, Linux and, and Unix uh, admins. And we really believe, again, in this sort of integrated team uh, to manage these large and distributed uh, resources that we're bringing to bear to, to service our, our scientific end users. And uh, the way that we, uh, we operate is on a global basis, and it's a pretty big team. We have like 14 uh, people on this team uh, worldwide, spread across three primary uh, sites. And if you looked at the sort of the, the profiles of these folks, uh, you really do see sort of a very interesting mix of uh, Unix admin, Linux admin, uh, as well as uh, database design and database administration skills. And, uh, one of the things we're really encouraging them all to do is cross-train. Uh, we're encouraging each one of them to take on responsibilities that the other ones are used to having. And o over time, uh, really being uh, much more effective in their role based on their ability to, to, to do something that in a more traditional functional organization they wouldn't have uh, been able to do. So most of our applications in the life science are very data-centric. Um, you know, we, we, we often describe it as our applications are disposable and our data uh, persists over time. And so we build a lot of applications that we throw away, um, but the, the data lasts forever. And this is, when you look at the $2 billion a year that we spend on research, um, the primary output of that is the knowledge and information, uh, most of which is stored in our, our database systems in, in some way, shape, or form. And uh, we also uh, spend a lot of time combining structured and unstructured data. Um, uh, so uh, we kind of think of all of our database systems and the, uh, the, the structures in those database systems, the columns in those systems, as the primary link to all of the disambiguated terms that live in all of our uh, unstructured content. And so uh, when I have an IC50, which is kind of a, a measurement in the life sciences, uh, in a column in a database, I want to be able to map that in some way, shape, or form to a reference for that IC50 in a document that lives in uh, some uh, file store somewhere. So as we were you know, starting to, to drive some new uh, behaviors in terms of adoption of database systems, um, we, had, we had to change some, some behaviors and some orientations. And so uh, getting out of this mode that Oracle is a solution to everything or that it sucks um, and that each application should have its own database, uh, you know, was, were, were real problems. Um, and that uh, there was this sort of religious argument going on as to whether you aggregate databases and to kind of big warehouses or whether you federate everything. And we really kind of tried to take the religious uh, fervor out of the, all the discussions and tried to focus people on solving the analytic problems. And what we found over and over again was that when we came back to the questions that the scientists had to ask and we translated those questions into SQL, that there were very, very cost-efficient ways to solve the, to answer those questions um, with uh, state-of-the-art new database engines, and that those solutions were very, very cost-effective. 
Uh, and, and so the alternative was kind of the Oracle DBA is saying, no, there's no way you can answer that question or that's, that's never going to perform. It's going to take uh, two months to answer that question. Uh, we went from that to the point where now uh, there's very few questions that our scientists uh, are, are asking that uh, we can't answer in some way, shape, or form or don't have a plan to answer uh, with, uh, with one of these new database engines. So scale is a huge challenge for us. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this next generation sequencing uh, technology that has uh, evolved over the last five years. Originally, these, these are boxes that you put samples uh, uh, in, into that you want uh, to, to understand the, the, the genetic sequence that, that's in those samples. And those, five years ago, those boxes cost 500 grand. Now they, each one of those boxes costs 50 grand. And so you can imagine, just like uh, us with, uh, with when we buy systems, right, something goes from 500 grand to 50 grand, everybody's got one all of a sudden. <laughs> and so uh, what we had uh, happening was uh, every scientist was buying one of these 50K machines. Uh, the difference was that the old machines would generate uh, order small number of gigabytes a year in terms of data. The new machines generated about 75 terabytes a year in terms of data. And so what happened would be our well-meaning um, uh, uh, support folks would uh, talk to these scientists, would hook these systems, uh, these, new, these new systems up to the, to the network, pointed at the file share, and last year we ran out of storage 15 times. <laughs> All right? And uh, it was, it, it was amazing, right? It took us like two or three times to figure out what was going on, right? And then uh, we ran out, you know, at least 10 or, or 12 more times before we could actually get people to change the behavior and figure out what we were going to do about it. And um, but so, so it's a really, you know, it's been a dramatic, uh, you know, 18 to 24 months, and we've seen similar things at the Broad Institute and the Sanger Center and many of the places that are on the cutting edge of doing this uh, next generation sequencing. So, uh, and, you know, in terms of the skill sets and the, uh, what was happening uh, on the, in the day-to-day -day operations, uh, from the perspective of our, our, our database uh, community, you know, they were kind of looking, this is their sort of traditional, these are, th you know, two of our data marts and one of our data warehouses in terms of size, and then all of a sudden along comes NGS, and the other, the other databases don't even register in terms of scale. Um, and this literally happened in a 12-month period, right? And so it created a, a not, not, not just a crisis, but, a, you know, sort of a, a radical uh, upheaval um, within the organization and, uh, you know, a complete re reconsidering of our, our, our technical architectures. So in addition to the scale problem, we also had, uh, you know, some other challenges. One was that the schemas cha changed constantly. So in research, uh, we're... Uh, supporting workloads and, and works uh, flows uh, where the experiments that our scientists run, you know, fail 90% plus of the, t uh, of the time. So they'll go from one system, one sort of approach to, to representing their data to a completely different uh, way to represent their data uh, over the course of a half a year. And we have to be able to change very, very quickly. Um, we really want to uh, get into this uh, process of, of doing data quality closer to the point of data curation. Immedi immediately when you've got these large quantities of data, you have to curate it um, at the point of data curation, and we we're trying to, to do that much more effectively. So we initiated a series of experiments <coughs> very quickly. So again, back this is the, sort of the exercise that we went through is this uh, specific, this is the specific example of that generalized case I said before, where you're trying to take all these new engines that are available and the, uh, the match them to these to these various workloads. So the ones that we that we tried, we tried you know obviously had lots of row stores. Uh, we tried column stores, we tried document stores, graphs, uh, as well as the MapReduce and, and array databases. And so uh, we kind of divvied these up into who was interested in, in what, and we set off uh, across a bunch of different databases and applications to try these systems. And so the specific one, some of the specific ones, we tried Vertica on some stuff, Hadoop on a couple of things, Couch and Mongo uh, on a couple of apps, and also the, the Paradigm 4 system, uh, as well as Neo4j and Allegro Graph, but uh, the graph databases didn't work out for us quite so well. 
Um, as, and as we entered these experiments, we had this fundamental principle, which was we were going to be driven by the questions and the analytics that our, that our customers had. So we set up a, a cool little website where any scientist could go and enter whatever scientific question they had um, without, without constraint. And we started collecting these questions, and we curated them a little bit. And so, you know, you see in 2010 and then 2011 kind of the number of questions we collected and then how, how many we were able to answer. And then we also had this very quantitative approach to understanding, okay, well, here are questions that need us to do additional work, either in integrating data or in going out and bringing in external data. And we have a kind of a roadmap now of, of exactly when we're going to be able to answer those questions. And that was a really critical component because as we went into these different experiments with these different database engines, there, were, there was evangelism going on, right? There was somebody that was in love with Neo4j, and there was somebody else that was in love with, you know, one of the other projects. And so we, we tried to keep it uh, objective by focusing on the actual uh, analytics and being as quantitative as we can. One of the, the, the most interesting outcomes was that we found that uh, in many cases, we needed to combine these these engines into best of breed uh, 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 kinds of situations. Where, uh, in this example, uh, we combined Hadoop with Vertica and SciDB in order to uh, uh, provide a work workflow uh, uh, database uh, pipeline and workflow for uh, next generation sequencing. And so this is, for, for me, this highlights or sort of this is antithetical to how traditional database folks would think about a lot of their database problems um, because you've got three different engines and you're, you're moving data from, from one cluster to another cluster uh, very dynamically, very rapidly. And um, the amount of uh, sophistication that we had to have in setting up these processes and setting up the uh, integration of these systems was, was non-trivial, both in terms of understanding the data, uh, understanding the performance of the underlying uh, engines, and also understanding the configuration of the systems on which those engines were running so that we could maximize the, uh, the resources across all of them. Uh, and, uh, but when you do it, you, you know, it's pretty remarkable. In this one, one case, uh, we had a number of scientists that uh, had queries that uh, they had tried uh, building and running in a, in a traditional engine and uh, that they had failed, right? They had one query that ran for a month uh, before, uh, before they killed it, right? I, why they let it run that long, I don't know. But uh, they ran that same query in under a minute um, in, uh, in this system. And so once you do one or two of those things, uh, you start to <coughs> realize or see that you can get this radical improvement in performance um, if you combine these uh, best of breed uh, solutions. Another uh, great example for us was the uh, array store. These are some some cases uh, that the use cases that we've applied the the array store to uh, finding targets and stratifying patients and, and identifying biomarkers. But um, you get into these sort of large multi-dimensional arrays, and very very quickly you can get yourself into trouble if you're trying to retrofit traditional relational database engines, and representing the data in the form in which uh, it's going to be queried in this in this case as an array uh, is a very creates a very uh, compelling result in terms of performance, and. Many of the things that we do on Paradigm 4 and in the array native database engines uh, uh, like it are uh, uh, very, very closely related to all the statistical services that, that, our, that our scientists use. And so uh, the relationship between our, our large R cluster and uh, the uh, Paradigm 4, the array native database, is very important. Again, this idea of maximizing system resources, right? We've got all these hardcore statistical engines that have lots of processor available to them. And you have this big persistent array native store that's got a lot of disk on it. Um, how do you set up these things in such a way that you maximize resources to, to solve these really, really hard problems? Uh, in, so, so just to give you an example of uh, this is just one. Uh, this is the only one I uh, unfortunately can share right now. But um, this is a, 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 a Vertica versus Oracle uh, comparison on one of our, our smaller systems. And right out of the box, without any tuning, we got you know a 10x kind of improvement in query performance. And the real key difference here is that uh, the Oracle system was running on a 
uh, you know, it was probably a seventy-five or eighty thousand dollar box, and you know, a bunch of shared storage that costs, you know, five or six k per terabyte. Uh, the Vertica system was a, a, a two U box with uh, you know a couple of terabytes a, a disk in it, and so the the difference in cost was dramatic um, between these two systems. And again, so if you get the better performance and it's cheaper. You kind of say, well, there's maybe representing bits on disk in the way that it's going to be queried is kind of the the, the, the right thing to do. Uh, we have examples where we've applied these same this same kinds of approaches, either with Vertica or with uh, uh, products like like Paradigm Four um, or Neo Four J, and we've realized as much as 100x uh, uh, benefit in terms of performance. And again, al almost always at a dramatically lower cost. I would say if I had to average it out, you know, probably 30% of the cost of uh, traditional relational database engines. So the, you know, when, when, uh, when we started the talk, you know, we started talking about, you know, the sort of one size does not fit all. And it takes a lot of risk to go off and uh, try one of these engines, put some effort into it. Uh, many of these new engines are immature in terms of their, their state as third-party products. But what we found over uh, at uh, you know at, at, at Novartis is that uh, it's very much worth it to do so, at least for for our use cases in the life science, which are arguably you know sort of high end. Um, but I think that many of you live in a in a world where you do have these uh, extreme uh, use cases and can benefit from these engines. And you know I really do encourage you to to take the time to to look at these new engines. Uh, and uh, evaluate uh, how they do, but but consider up front not just you know whether it's some cool new engine from from some hot new vendor uh, that's getting a lot of press, but rather you know what is the fundamental empirical characteristics characteristics of your workload, and what does what are the characteristics of that engine? What is that engine fundamentally designed to do? Um, uh, and and that as you put these new engines up, if you have success in, in proving that, they're, that, that they work, that uh, the operations and maintenance of those, of those systems really do require this uh, integrated skill set, which I think is a huge opportunity for folks in, 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 in our community here uh, to become more involved in the, the database systems and uh, kind of uh, the, the end user applications and the analytics uh, that, are, that are really driving uh, the next generation of, of systems that are being deployed in uh, companies and all kinds of organizations. So that is uh, all I have, and I wanted to make sure I left enough time for, for questions and answers. Hopefully this has been useful, interesting, not completely boring. I know it started really early, so definitely early for me. Um, but uh, happy to take, uh, you know, uh, 10 or 15 minutes to an answer uh, questions. Please come up to the microphone and announce your name and affiliation. Thank you. Hi, uh, Paul Krizak from AMD. Hi. Uh, I was curious that uh, you, you mentioned that you had a, at least one use case where stringing multiple database engines together was, was effective. Um, could you maybe t talk just a little bit about maybe what the data transformations were between each of those stages that made mm -hmm. it effective? Yep. So I think that uh, the the way uh, in that in that particular use case and uh, the uh, the way we think about our data is uh, in these three primary uh, levels, or sort of a framework. So there's sort of QA level data, and oftentimes we want that data to live close to the the actual machine itself, the instrument that's generating the data. And um, uh, oftentimes that, that data is used to, to validate or, or verify the results from, from that machine. And the, the queries are relatively simple, but performance matter, matters a lot in terms of write. So we want to be able to write into that system very, very quickly. Um, the uh, design of those data structures uh, oftentimes is... Uh, uh, optimized for write, and there's a very small number of fields that then go to the next level for us, which is the, we call it the experimental level uh, data. So 
Uh, once you QA the data, then you want to take the data from that experiment and combine it with data from other experiments that are, are, are in that same lab, for lack of a better term. And that when, that, when it's transformed, you take a small, a, a small subset of the data, it's probably 10% of the data in that case, uh, with the, the associated metadata, and you put that, we put, put that into this new data source. There's not a lot of transformation that goes on at that stage. Um, it's mostly uh, just a, you know, a, 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 extract and, and load rather than a transform kind of activity. And then uh, when we go from the experimental data, where we kind of have aggregated a bunch of stuff together, to the next level up, which is cross-experimental data, so we take across all the different labs and we integrate all that, we do a lot of transformation on that data. We actually manipulate it very, very heavily with, uh, with uh, all kinds of statistical algorithms. And this is where we found it very useful to, to again, be putting stuff into PsyDB because we want to maintain provenance of, those, of, of that data as it's transformed. We want to be able to go back and say, well, I used this algorithm two months ago, but I want to use this new algorithm to do that same transformation and see what the, what the difference would be. And that was one of the advantages of the CIDB system. It's got provenance, provenance built into the system, assuming that you're going to do those kinds of uh, transformational activities. I don't know if that helps. Yeah, but thank you. Hi, Doug Hughes, DE Shaw Research. I have two questions. One is that we found with large volumes of particularly scientific data that you run into the problem where, you know, the spontaneous bit flip problem where you can't necessarily guarantee the integrity of your data unless you're actively checking that. Yeah. And I'm wondering how you address that in the database context and what sorts of techniques you're using for that. That's the yeah. first question. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. Go second. Go part. ahead. Go go with that one first. So so uh, so it's 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 very important again, you know, to understand and define exactly which kinds of uh, transformations uh, are required in order to maintain quality, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I s assume that you know we're saying that as as a database is being created or as it's being generated, that you're going to want to uh, check um, the the data that's coming into it and we, we spend a lot, uh, uh, a lot of time sorting through which uh, uh, engines, like a great example is the, the Volt system, which operates at very high, high performance, and making sure that as the data is coming into the Volt system that you can look very quickly, inspect the, the, the bits, and determine whether or not you want to feed that back and start a different transaction. I'm actually know. asking, though, about the data that's coming out. Okay. I mean, you, so you can guarantee the data coming in is good. But when you read it back, how yeah. do you know that it's the data that you put into it? Yeah, so uh, in the, uh, it, it depends, right? So we, we have this idea of uh, sort of data quality levels, right, that we uh, sometimes you don't, and sometimes it's okay that you don't. Sometimes you absolutely have to assure that the data that, uh, that, that, that came into the system is exactly represented as, uh, in the way that it goes out. But in many of our applications, especially as you move sort of up in the, earlier in the discovery process, um, you know, if there are things that aren't, uh, that, that, that aren't consistent, um, they can and should be caught with data quality mechanisms. So there's some systems where we want to design that kind of uh, quality assurance in. There's somewhere uh, into the very beginning of the process and make sure we control it at the point of data creation and ensure integrity as it's transformed. There's somewhere we kind of don't care and we're going to catch it on the back end. Okay. Well, my next question was about the slide that you showed with the questions and answers. Mm -hmm. uh, can you go back to that one for a second? Questions. This one? No. Um, no, it's like questions asked, answers given. Yeah, yeah that one. Okay. Um, I noticed a couple things. One is that you had a lot more questions in 2010 and 2011, and, but in 2011 you had a higher percentage of answers, and I wonder if you could add a little bit of color to these numbers and if they mean anything. Yeah, so uh, we had a bolus of, you know, so we started in, in 2010, so, you know, there were all these things that people wanted to ask um, that they hadn't, so when they, we got a kind of an influx of a huge number that people had been building up. And so I think that was the primary cause of, you know, the most questions raised. Um, and, um, you know, and then we were able to sort of answer, we, we think that sort of steady state, there are these 
30 to 40 really interesting core questions that people are going to come up with. Um, you know, we tackle, you know, it, it feels like two or three a month um, and, uh, you know, maybe one a week um, kind of a thing. And uh, that if we can kind of keep up at, at that pace, uh, we, we, we feel like we're doing pretty well. The biggest challenge with a lot of these questions is many of them require the integration, uh, in either integration or federation, of no less than 15 or 20 different data sources across the organization. And so you get back to the, you know, your first question, which is like, okay, if you're doing that kind of integration and you're trying to do it very rapidly so that you keep this, this drumbeat, um, the uh, uh, opportunity to, uh, uh, to lose quality uh, is, is very, very high. Um, so it's, it's a very big challenge. Yeah. Thank you. I'm not sure who is first come in these parallel queues. Is that okay? Thanks. Uh, Mark Burgess from CF Engine. Um, most database queries in uh, system administration are probably mostly read, but we have systems that are mostly write. Do you mm -hmm. have any comments about optimizing for mostly write? I do. So um, another uh, great new system to look at is this system called, uh, called Volt. Um, it's an open source system um, that um, was, uh, you know, really, you know, designed initially around this idea that uh, while wow, most, most write-oriented database problems can be represented in memory, and so why not just create a, a memory-based system? And most of those systems don't really need a SQL interface, so Volt doesn't have a SQL interface on top of it. And, uh, and I, I believe that that whole sort of SQL versus no SQL argument is just kind of a red herring. Um, but the, uh, I, I think that there are really great opportunities to optimize for uh, write applications, and you can do, you know, incredible scale. Um, we, we did a, pro there was a project at Volt that they did uh, that was, you know, 500,000 transactions a second on, you know, 50K worth of hardware kind of a thing. Like, it's like very, very compelling stuff. But I think the challenge is that a lot of the existing databases, the, the traditional OLTP databases, they do pretty well. And there's so much money going into optimizing it. Like when you say, OK, what, what does Oracle do with the billions of dollars that it spends? They figure out the next way to get the next small improvement <laughs> in their Oracle engine so that, so that people don't want to kill it. And, and so um, it's been so optimized that you're probably just as good using one of the traditional OLTP engines for most applications. Um, the challenge there, I think, is, is manageability. Um, you look at a lot of the feature and function in, in Oracle today, and it's been put in there uh, to do things other than pure hard, hardcore OLTP. And so it just becomes kind of unwieldy uh, to manage. And that's one of the benefits of a system like Volt is that it's, it's much more compact, right? It's built for purpose. And so you don't have to uh, confuse this, either the system or the administration uh, with things that, that aren't required. Does that help? Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you. Quick, quick point. Uh, do you have any experience with the non-uniform memory architecture problems using this? Uh, yes, but uh, better better off taken offline. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Margo Seltzer from a large variety of different organizations, all simultaneously. Hello, Margo. Um, <laughs> hi, Andy. How are you? So, um, I'm curious about the granularity of the provenance you're storing in SciDB. Is it really on a cell by cell basis or a major transformation by major transformation basis? It depends, right? And it's a, it's a fundamental challenge, right? Um, we, you know, and I think the SciDB guys will tell you that they've they've had use cases. Uh, for both, and they've had strong argument for both. Um, you know, uh, probably good to talk to Paul about you know what he really prefers to do and what he wants to do. I think he has gone down the path of not doing it on a cell by cell basis initially, but um, uh, you know it's you know it's 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 a it's a fundamental problem. Have you have you talked to him about it? Well, I was just talking to my team yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the, the provenance thing is amazing, and it's one of these features um, that, uh, you know, uh, that there are a lot of people that are advocating for now, and I think rightfully so, and it's shocking to me that the existing vendors, whether it's IBM or Microsoft or Oracle, have not put into their system. I mean, provenance should be 
you know, sort of an inherent feature in database systems, don't you think? Wait a minute. So, um, <laughs> no, I, I do need to jump in here, so I'm okay. now changing out good. of my Usenix hat and into my Oracle hat. So, um, That's good. And, and I don't work in this group, but yeah. when we were at the workshop on the theory and practice of provenance this summer, um, somebody from the Oracle server group said that the recall functionality in Oracle Server actually gives you a lot of provenance if you know how to use it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know much about it, but in theory, a lot of the provenance of the data in your tables is actually there. Yeah, that would, that would be great. And again, that's the kind of thing too that scares me, right? The, with the the you know uh, with with Oracle is there's almost nothing that I can't do with Oracle if I have the right people and if I have the right time and I, I have enough resource. But uh, you know, a lot a, there are a lot of our uh, applications and database systems which can and should be addressed uh, without unnatural acts of, of human intervention. And I think that's a big part of what this trend is towards in terms of, uh, uh, you know, purpose-built database engines. Anything else? Again, thank you very much for your time, and thanks for coming this morning.